Good morning, everybody. Welcome to One Million Cups. Um, how many of you are here for the first time? Yeah. Welcome to One Million Cups. We're glad for you to finally get out and check us out. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, if you ask questions during the Q&A, make sure that you get the microphone up to your mouth. Find one of the prompters standing on each side of the aisle with a microphone and signal them. If you have a question, they'll get to you as quick as they can. Um, we're kind of doing a milestone achievement today at One Million Cups. We're actually live streaming today. So for those of you all that can't make it in the future, you can watch it in your office on a live stream. So uh, we'll be, we'll be uh, publishing that link on Twitter this morning for all those outside of um, the e-factory who want to uh, tune in. So all of you people out there in live stream land, welcome to One Million Cups. Um, this morning, we've got two great speakers. And our first speaker is Mr. Ken Craig, and he has a great product called Cone Chips. Uh, give Ken a big warm welcome. Thank you very much. Well, good morning and welcome out here. Well, he already shocked me right off the bat, said we're live streaming. So I, now I am officially a nervous wreck. <laughs> uh, anyway, me and my partner Mark Boring here, we are the developers of a product called Cone Chips. We kind of got lucky here. We invented a new word, cone chips. And actually followed it up with a second new word, dipalicious. <laughs> so anyway, 30 years ago I developed this product, and actually by accident. Uh, I kind of invent a few things here and there, and I invented a retractable seat cover for new cars. And so uh, a guy named Edward Lowe had an ad in the paper, and he wanted new inventions and stuff like this. Edward Lowe, by the way, is the guy who invented kitty litter. <laughs> anyway, so... I went there with my retractable seat cover, and this guy was talking. He said, well, Ken, that's a real neat idea, but the car people, they'll take that, and they'll make a change here, they'll make a change there, and it's theirs. You're not going to get anything. He said, what I'm looking for is repeat items such as food. He said, I'm working right now with bottled water, and I laughed at him. Bottled water? Who's going to buy bottled water? <laughs> Whoa, boy. <laughs> well, guess what? Anyway, so he was telling me all about these food items and different things like that, and his, his kitty litter, et cetera, how it repeat items are the what makes the money. So anyway, I left there, and I was in a good mood. He liked my invention. I didn't make any kind of deal or nothing like that, but I am kind of a chocoholic. So there was a nice little Dairy Queen on the way home, and I stopped to get a chocolate shake. When I did that, there was a lady and her little son in front of me, and she had just handed him a cone that she got from the window. And she turned around and got her cone, and hit him, and by accident, when she did, he dropped his cone on the ground. I saw cone chips. <laughs> I actually did, that, that's right, the name popped in my head, everything. I saw a related, a repeat food item that looked good, but it was on the ground. <laughs> so I went back home, right from there, drew it all up, started experimenting, and that's when I developed the cone chips. Then I did what everybody else does. I forgot about them, didn't even do nothing about it. Went on my way, became a mechanical engineer, then later on I became an audio-video engineer. I actually retired from the audio-video field with Ed McMahon as his last engineer. So I had a, a nice career of, uh, in the entertainment industry, Genesis Entertainment, for 10 years, running around with all the rock stars for another 10 years. So anyway, I got to, I got to meet Mark Boring here a couple years ago at Bass Pro. Uh, he is one of their designers that does the waterfalls, the rocks, and all the good stuff that you see. Well, that's Martin. And I was telling him about, we was talking about different things we've done in our life and our different inventions and all that, and I was telling him about the cone ships. He said, well, why didn't you put them out there? I said, well, I, I just kind of spaced it off and went in my way and went into a different field. He said, well, make some. Bring them to work. So I did. And I brought them in, and everybody at Bass Pro went crazy over them. So I said, oh, okay, let's experiment a little bit more. And so we did. Mark's got an old schoolhouse. We refurbished it. This is where we do our cone chips right now. So it's actually called the Cone Chip Factory. <laughs> and as you see, we've, we've got our sign out front now. But it's all been redone. This is the very first chip. The very first chip was completely covered in chocolate. 
It was a triangle like a Dorito, but it was made out of the sugar cone. Well, it advanced to looking like a real cone. And it saved us money on chocolate, too. <laughs> As you can see, we, we went through a variety. Hundreds of different styles of chips and flavors and all this stuff. But we had to come up with three. So we could actually market this without being in trouble trying to manufacture all these different flavors at once. And we came up with white chocolate, milk chocolate, and my favorite, the dark chocolate. Now our dark chocolate is not the bitter dark chocolate. It's a sweet dark chocolate. And it's turned out to be a favorite of many. Now, so we started producing, manufacturing, putting them out there. One of the funny things is, is we had a little plan, and it, it actually worked. It kind of scared me, but it worked. We wanted to get these chips out to the theaters first in Branson. We did that for a reason, because we knew that some of these people would take them back to their home states. Well, boy, did they. <laughs> Two weeks after getting our first chips out in the theaters, we get a phone call from a place called Amcom. These guys said, are you the cone chip people? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, my, I'm vice president of sales and marketing at Amcon. And he said, are you familiar with us? I said, no, sir. <laughs> he said, well, we distribute to 3,000 convenience stores from Florida to Minnesota. We want to carry your cone chips. I said, sir, that's wonderful, but we can't even supply the theaters, so much less any convenience stores or anybody else. He said, will you please, please keep in touch with us when you guys get to manufacturing? We'd like to deal with you. I said, okay, we'd love that. Well, wasn't two days later, I get another phone call, this time from another distributor, and it was called Delaware North. Delaware North handles all the concessions for the big, like the Rams, the Kansas City Chiefs, et cetera, Dallas Cowboys. He said, you got the next concession food of the millennium. And again, can you get us some? Well, not really. <laughs> I can't provide the theaters. <laughs> well... So I told him again, we're going to be manufacturing, and we'll get right back at you once we do. Well, that happened for the next three to four weeks, distributors after distributors. Even local distributors here found our products and like them. So what we're doing right now, well, first of all, we went out, we got a billboard. Some of you guys have probably seen our billboards in town. We got the big one on Campbell, and probably wonder what it is. Well, we've also done a bunch of your trade shows here. Now, uh, unlike most trade shows where you got the nice little uh, curtain in front of you, the nice little tablecloth and the curtain behind you, well, it's kind of handy to have a builder and a custom builder behind you because our booths are a little bit different. We take you back to the old-fashioned style. You like going into a store, but you're in actually a booth at a trade show. So we've marketed many, many different trade shows. We got our product, well, we did our news. We got uh, radio ads, TV ads, et cetera, et cetera. We are at a point right now we can only produce 60 cases a week. That's all we can do right now. That's one shift. We are employing the Amish. All of our, piece, all of our product right now is made, handmade, piece by piece, by eight Amish women. <laughs> and they know their chocolates. <laughs> so anyway... We're at the point now, oh, when we're doing our research, we did marketing research for almost a year, getting this product everywhere. Right now, we actually have it in North Carolina, we actually have it in Michigan, we have it in Texas, and we have it here. But again, we're still at very small amounts. But what we found out was we made this for ice cream, but it fits so many more things. We had no idea. People that are wine connoisseurs love the dark chocolate with their wine. Coffee drinkers, they love the white chocolate. They like to dip these in their coffee. Of course, the ice cream. We also found out that people like to go to McDonald's, take a bag of cone chips, and get the frozen lattes. So we found out that this product is not just for ice cream. Matter of fact, 98% of the people that's tried this product have never even dipped it in ice cream. They eat it right out of the bag. Now we have upgraded, we have our new bag now. We started with the bag you saw earlier. That bag was, was a nice bag, but it was killing us because we had to buy labels front and back, had to do all the FDA stuff. And next thing you know, you got 60 cents into just the bag and labels for one bag. Now that's getting costly, that's not cost effective. So anyway, now we got that changed. 
once we get into production, we're still at 40 cents a bag though with ease and print. But once we're in full production and actually have the packaging and bagging machine, we're down to two cents a bag. That's a big difference. Anyway, what we're doing right now is we're looking for a facility and we're looking for the machinery. We found the company to make our machinery. It's $3.5 million for one turnkey line. But that line will produce 1,000 chips every minute. In other words, that's uh, about 100 bags a minute. That's not bad. <laughs> and that, again, is one line. But it's a turnkey line. It goes into our coating, our nuts, and it also goes into packaging. So that's what we're going for right now. We have no choice but to get this. Now, the neat thing is, as once we got this in place, again, we're going to be limited because even we're the only ones in the whole world doing this right now. There is no product like this at all. We've searched everywhere. There is nothing like this in the whole world. So we got a couple of advantages. One of the big advantages is we have no competition, period. And I'm not just talking about competition about somebody making this product. I'm talking about competition in with distributors. We got wide open doors to all distributors because we are not competing with another product that they're carrying for somebody else that's similar. That's hard to find. So we got a real good little gold mine right there. Anyway, so we're looking, for our, we're looking for our building, we're looking for our machinery, et cetera, et cetera. And all, honestly, what we're doing right now is we're at the point where we have no choice but to expand. We got our business plan together. We're looking for $10 million. Well, the funny thing is, is we came here to, to represent about this, but in the last two to three weeks, we have been hit up by over four investors, each of them can do the $10 million. And last week, we got hit by a bank. And, yes, sir. One minute, okay. Uh, we got hit by a bank. Now, I kind of like the bank deal because, again, I'm not giving up part of my business. I'd rather pay a high interest than give up the business if it's feasible. But now I also realize that some of the investors bring something else to the table other than just money. Some of them have some pretty good connections that are worth a lot of money. <laughs> So anyway, that's what we're doing here today, is to tell you about our product. We got a sample for everybody back there. There's bags of them. Uh, at the end of this, you guys can grab you a bag, or you can have them passed out however you want to do it. But there's some there. There should be something for everybody. Now, the last thing here, we've checked out four or five different buildings. We got Fort Worth. We have Kansas City. We even have a place in Michigan that are trying to get us to go to their area and use their economic development. In other words, that they'll you know, help you finance, give you tax breaks, get you a building, and all this kind of stuff. But we like Springfield. And I also like the fact we're in the middle of everything, and you have prime trucking. My stuff can go anywhere I want in the U.S. with that trucking. So we'd really like to stay here in Springfield. Uh, again, we got things, like I said, that are going with other investors. If anybody would like to, to talk to us about it, we'll be uh, glad to talk to you. Uh, but at this time, again, like I say, I'm, I'm not even sure where we're at in the financial part because of what we got going on the last two weeks. But uh, anyway, I thank you all for your time. Enjoy your conference. Mm -hmm. As we'll open it up for question and answer. Is there any value in going with somebody like Keebler? who's already doing something like this where you don't have to learn all this yourself? No, there isn't. Uh, there would be if there was a machine for doing this. Uh, but on the search for our machine, we found out that there is no such machine. A matter of fact, we found the builder for our machine, and it takes us actually eight to ten months for them to make that machine. And that's another good thing about the competition because nobody's going to be able to jump on us again when we start unless they get a machine made, which will take another eight to ten months after ours. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the internet. Now, the funny thing is, as a matter of fact, just a week ago, we got hit by the people in America that uh, there's a place in Fort Worth of doing a big expo on new American food products. They contacted us on that, and we asked them the same question, how did you find us? And they said, we searched out new and unusual products in America. <laughs> And we popped up first. <laughs> Do you have a patent on your project? 
Uh, you can't patent a food product, but we do have a trademark. So we are a trademark, yes. Yeah, I think she just answered uh, what I was going to ask. I mean, you, you can't patent the food. I, you know, I think you have a great idea here, and I think, uh, I think you're going to have a lot of uh, other more established food companies that are going to want to try to jump on this and probably not be able to use the exact same product, but get something similar. Well, what do you predict you will do in the future to counteract that? Because, you know, you can get a $10 million mm -hmm. investment and mm -hmm. all of a sudden it can become worthless because these guys will try to take your, your idea away from you. Well, well, one of the things is, uh, in our word, in our name, we thought of all this stuff. We played devil's advocate from the day one on this and trying to destroy everything. One of the things that we had the name, the original cone chips, is just for that purpose because somebody will eventually come out after us with some kind of a chip. So we actually got the word uh, wine wedges too <laughs> because that'll be our next little batch that comes out. But anyway, the word original, we put that on there for a reason. Actually, cone chips is a good name by itself. But the original comes into play when somebody does come against us. We will come back out with a marketing campaign talking about the original. There's nothing like the original. So there's a reason that name is in there, and that is exactly the reason. Uh, actually, again, uh, even with this one line that, that we'll be able to put out, like I said, a thousand chips a minute, it's going to really, still we're going to be small because we can only handle maybe one good distributor, even with that big line. For instance, uh, let's go to the sports stuff. Let's go to, with Mr. Delaware North who said that we got the next concession food. You put this in a, a, a stadium, let's say the Rams or the Chiefs or, or whoever. You got 60,000 people in one setting for one game. I'm not sure how many of that 60,000 is going to buy, but if I use the little old 2%, that's a lot of chips. You times that through all these stadiums, and you do that weekly, that one line is not going to be able to handle grocery stores. He's handling concessions. So this is, a, a, again, like I say, to actually put this to wherever we want, we're going to need five to ten lines before it's all said and done. And that still ain't going to do everything. And that's two shifts. I, actually, we already have some sales reps ready to go. We got them in Texas. We, we're taking care of the whole Southwest right now. We, we want to stay away from the West Coast, and maybe a little bit up north and a little bit on the east, but right now we want to focus on this area. This is a southern product, and we want the South to enjoy it first. Yeah, I know uh, chocolate is real. Um, I mean, you have to refrigerate it. You have to really be careful with temperatures mm -hmm. and stuff for you guys. Um, does that increase your cost quite a bit, or how do you store no, it? No, no, actually, uh, uh, we're storing in cool areas right now. We're not having any problem with that, but you brought up a good question because our Internet sales, we stop the Internet stuff during the summer. We won't send them or ship them over the Internet because, uh, again, you'll get a bag that's probably melted together. We can't tell what the postal office is going to do with them or, or other shippers. So the Internet stuff is basically done. Now, Unfortunately, the theaters are going to kind of miss out a little bit on this year, too, because Harder House is eating us alive. <laughs> We're having to restock with both of the Harder Houses here in Springfield every week now. The people in Springfield are now getting an idea of what a cone chip is. And so they keep emptying our, our booth out pretty quick. So now it's kind of putting our other places in jeopardy. I can't even let a salesman go out now. We, we cannot afford to get another account until we got something going. Yeah, it is a very good problem. You, uh, you gave statistics like 90% of our customers don't dip our product in anything. Where do you collect those metrics, and how can you capitalize on that in the different applications that you apply your product? Well, one of the things that we did first is, is we went out and we, we sort of did like the Boy Scouts. We handed out everything. <laughs> we, we wanted samples. We wanted to see expressions. Uh, and by the way, that's another neat thing. When you hand somebody a bag of cone chips and they've never seen this and they look at that, they become a kid. I have never had so much fun putting a product out in my life. Everybody seems to enjoy this product, and that is a lot of fun. And the funny thing is, is I have yet to find one person to give me a bad comment or to give me a, I don't like it. I haven't had that yet. We did have one lady a, a couple weeks ago at one of the, uh, the trade shows we went to. Uh, she walked by there, and we was giving out samples. Would you like a sample, ma'am? Oh, no, 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 no. She just walked on. <laughs> I continued watching her while Mark was still doing his stuff. And she had her husband with her, and she does this to him. 
So he walks around the back of the booth, comes back, and gets a couple samples. <laughs> and then walks the other way, and I see him going back, and he meets with the wife and hands her to the cone chip. So they're both eating the cone chip. <laughs> Next thing I know, he comes over and buys six bags of these cone chips. <laughs> so I have still yet to see one that didn't like it or one to give me a bad comment. <laughs> so the, the woman that you were talking about just bought six bags of the cone chips. How much did she pay for each bag? Uh, we did them for $3 at that convention for each bag. <laughs> We have them on the internet right now. Like I said, we're getting ready to stop that, though, because of the heat. But right now, we're doing a case on the internet. It's a 10-lot case, and it's $3 a piece. It's 30 bucks, but we're doing free shipping because our cost that we put it out to wholesale is $2 a bag. Uh, and it's kind of a while, too, because there's a big variation in prices. Harder House, for instance, is $2.89. But if you go to a theater in Branson, they're anywhere from 4 to four fifty per bag. So, uh, again... The concession people really like it because they can get higher dollar. <laughs> so, you have a unique name, and you have a or you soon to have a machine that no one else has. Is there anything proprietary in your formula, uh, in your sourcing of your chocolate, that can't be knocked off? Uh, yes, yeah, a matter of fact, we got three new chips that we're not we're not going to put out until we get the machine. But we've actually formulated. I went to uh, Atlanta about four weeks ago and formulated three new chips. We got a new chip called a power chip, and that's an energy chip. That's like drinking two or three Red Bulls. You're gonna have it in your chips. <laughs> we also invented for the ladies that like this center and PM at night, forget it, because now you're gonna have Serenity, a cone chip that helps you go to sleep. <laughs> and then our last one that we developed was the glute-free organic cone chip. So them three will be coming out after we get going in production. So we, we are set for different stages to, uh, to exceed and go past, like you say, the next competition or whoever comes against us. Say so you briefly mentioned uh, speaking to, uh, uh, I guess, other places like uh, up north in Dallas mm -hmm. and, and those states are mm -hmm. wooing you to locate there. Have you uh, been wooed by Missouri? Uh, yes, we have, Kansas City. Actually, Kansas City is expecting us to, to do some stuff with them. I like Springfield. <laughs> so they're wanting us to get back to them. We got another appointment in two weeks to get back there, but I, I hate to give them bad news. I like Kansas City. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a nice city, but I'm Springfield. <laughs> and Springfield has some good business. Yes. You're, you're only r running one shift. Why not run three shifts with the line you have now? Uh, we will, but again, like I was telling you earlier, it's still, we're still not in a real cost-effective range. We're making some money, but we're, we're like a mom and Paul store. That's the kind of money we're getting now. Once we get into full production into the factory, uh, even one line and doing two shifts, now I shouldn't be giving these figures, but I will. A three-year forecast, full-time, one line, two shifts, is $52 million profit after all costs. Not bad. You mentioned that there is no machine like this. Can you patent the machine? If there are going to be copiers of the product, then what about your machine? That you Actually, that we have uh, discussed that. You're exactly on it, yes. And also, too, once we get this thing going, uh, I'm marketing is one of my fortes. I love marketing. So we're going to do a, a thing a little bit different in our marketing plan. Uh, we're the distributors that we're dealing with. We're going to listen to them. If they want something to, done in that area, we're going to put our ads there. We're going to do whatever they want. But we're also going to do what I call the cone chip factory franchise. We're going to get these little ice cream things and put them in the malls. We're going to make fresh cone chips right there. And you're going to have a little cone chip factory in the mall. I'd love to cut a deal with Ben and Jerry's <laughs> and do a partner. But anyway, we're going to do uh, that. But that's also going to do marketing for the area that we are selling the chips. Now, and eventually, we will franchise them out. Yes? And now, we, we kind of like that. We wanted the old style. We wanted it to look like something done in the early 1900s. Uh, remember, the ice cream cone is actually, what, invented in St. Louis? So it's here in Missouri. So now, at the second stage of that ice cream cone has come back to Missouri. Talk about your two biggest hurdles so far. What have been your challenges and how do you get past them? <laughs> the funny thing is, I've had no challenges. This is the only business I've ever walked into that I've ever been into that every door is flew open. 
I've had to make no adjustments. I've had to not, uh, you know, take a detour to make a change. Nothing like that's happened to me in this business. I have been shocked about that. I've told many people. I don't know what it is. It's almost like divine. <laughs> I think a lot of our entrepreneurs would like you to share that blessing with them. <laughs> uh, as, as, as always, we wrap up uh, our final question. Well, I am we a pre community help you. Well, uh, and like I said earlier, uh, we want to build a factory here. Uh, we need it funded. But like I said, we got people right now that are, are, are dealing with us on that. So uh, if you'd like to, to know any more or you want a business plan from us or anything like that, uh, get a hold of us here at the end, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you or, and, and whatever we could do. But we appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Ken. And, and by the way, I'd be careful about talking to a banker and saying something about high interest. I'd, I wouldn't. Yeah, I know, I know. Hey, a couple of announcements. Um, SPIN 66, the Innovation Summit, is scheduled for May the 5th. I think we've got a couple people here from Mercy R&D. The... Okay, yeah, there we go. There's Cody. Okay. If you have any questions, grab one of those guys. Um, this is scheduled for May the 5th, and uh, presenters include Jeff Schrag, Howard Follis, uh, Keely Davis, and uh, Sherry Coker. I know Sherry's here. Hey, Sherry. Okay, if you, and I think the um, advanced tickets are $25, and after next Monday, that goes to 40 Is that correct? Okay. Uh, also, Refine M, which is one of our presenters um, in the past here. I don't know that I see NK here this morning, but uh, he's launching uh, essential gear for project managers and um, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the E-Factory. Um, he's having a, a launch um, party, if you will. Uh, that is today. And uh, without further ado, we're going to introduce Jim Blancet with uh, Copper Run Distillery. And it's too bad this is 9.30 in the morning instead of 9.30 at night. Good morning. I'm Jim Blancet. And as a whiskey distiller, I'm making my grandfathers very proud. <laughs> I'm here today to uh, present Copper Run Distillery, which is a small craft distillery located just north of Branson, Missouri. Uh, and normally, uh, no matter what time it is, in the morning, afternoons, or evenings, my presentations are based on pouring samples and getting feedback from, from everybody. And I would like to do that after the presentation. We did bring some samples to share with you. I would love to get your feedback. And uh, so we'll do that directly after the presentation. Today, I would like to focus on our business model. Uh, I think our products speak for themselves. So today, I would like to share some information on what makes us unique as a small craft distillery. Uh, I like to compare when people ask me, what is a, a micro distillery or a, an artisan distillery? I like to compare it to the uh, beer industry back in the uh, late 80s and 90s. Prior to that, we had light beer to choose from, right? And then the uh, late 80s and the 90s with the microbrewery uh, movement, now we have all these wonderful styles of beer to choose from, from stouts and ales and lagers. And uh, nobody really thinks about light beer so much anymore. <laughs> uh, and the same thing's happening with the distilleries across the country that are now uh, doing the same thing. Uh, so now we have a variety of spirits that people are producing. Um, here at Copper Run, we really focus on the ability to um, have flexibility in our production. Uh, we are able to uh, change our production and create different spirits with very little effort. And that helps us stand out to the big guys. Uh, so our focus uh, as a small craft distillery is the quality of the spirits, not the quantity. So we do small batches, and we put all of our focus and emphasis on each individual batch, making sure that it is uh, the top quality that we're able to produce. And we're able to use techniques that have been around for a long time. Uh, making whiskey here in the Ozarks is a great pleasure, standing on the shoulders of the old timers who I have great respect for, who were able to make whiskey out in the woods. 
chopping down the trees and the firewood and, and the water to cool off the stills. That was a great amount of work. And the techniques that they developed made really, really good whiskey. So to be able to use those old style traditional techniques at Copper Run is a great pleasure. And then we build on top of that by being innovative and coming up with new techniques and ideas that uh, uh, haven't been around for a long, long time, if ever. So it gives us a, a chance to do something really unique uh, product-wise. The um, uh, we, we have a little video that I'd like to share, a slideshow that can kind of give you a feel for what we do at Copper Run. Uh, by the way, how many people have been to Copper Run? Uh, 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 I would invite you to come down and see us when you get a chance, and this will give you a, a feel for what we're doing uh, there in Walnut Shade. Okay, I, uh, I love that photograph. We've had uh, many great times down there at Copper Run, and the feedback from our customers is one of the greatest pleasures that I receive as, uh, as a, a whiskey maker. Um, I'd like to focus now on our business philosophy. We, um, our slogan uh, is small batch and big passion. And the uh, the, the main focus that we have here is making the best out of our limited resources as a small business. And I'm, I'm very pleased with our ability to wring out every benefit from uh, uh, the opportunities that we have around us. Uh, I mentioned flexibility earlier, and it's really important to our business model to be able to move quickly and come up with new ideas and implement them right away. Uh, willingness to take on challenges and not follow the, the big guy's business model. Uh, we uh, stress free thinking as the, uh, very, very important in our philosophy and uh, sort of leading and uh, creating our own path and doing what we feel in our heart is the best for our, our business. Um, the business model goes on here from small batch and big passion. Small being our resources starting out. Uh, small budgets, small bank account, <laughs> small facility, and small production capacity. And, and with these, we, we turn these into big opportunities. Uh, we're, we're big in creativity and improvisation, which is very important production flexibility, which we talked about a little bit, enabling us to make whiskeys and rums and brandies and, and different products. Use of technology, uh, big in resourcefulness, and big in optimization. And uh, making all of this work for us has uh, been very successful to us to this point. Um, I mentioned our products that we'll be sampling soon. Uh, we make a lot of young whiskey. And the Moonshine is our flagship product, which works very well for us here in the Ozarks. Moonshine is just unaged whiskey. So it works very well for us to produce a lot of whiskey. It literally comes out of the still, into the bottle, and into our customers' hands. Uh, so we don't need to store it for very long. It's very fresh. As my friend Bubba says, Thursday was a good year for the Moonshine. <laughs> The overproof moonshine is the traditional Ozark Mountain moonshine. Uh, we bottle that at 120 proof, which is barrel strength. 
And uh, so it comes in a smaller bottle. Uh, I think you get about the same amount of alcohol <laughs> compared to the standard uh, proof bottle. So the overproof uh, at barrel strength then can go into the barrel, allowing us to age our young whiskey into more a, a traditional style whiskey, such as a, a bourbon or a straight whiskey. And it's a great pleasure to be able to make whiskey here in the Ozarks with our perfect water. Uh, every time it rains, it goes through our limestone and becomes future whiskey. So I love the rain. I love the limestone water. And the white oak trees that grow here in the Ozarks are world famous for making the best whiskey barrels. So we actually buy our barrels from Lebanon, Missouri, and use uh, Ozark Mountain oak to age our Ozark Mountain whiskey in. And with the way we produce our whiskeys, uh, using traditional methods and making cuts, we produce a really clean whiskey today. So it doesn't take years and years and years to age in the barrel to, to be tasty. So the um, uh, small batch whiskey that we have is only a year old. And I'm looking forward to uh, getting your feedback to see how, what, that, what, what you think of that young whiskey. We also do rum, which is different from whiskey. It's whiskeys are all grain-based, which is why you have corn whiskey and rye whiskey and wheat whiskey. The rum comes from a different plant. It comes from sugar cane. And so we make our rum from brown sugar and molasses. And who doesn't like brown sugar? So when we make rum, it's like going on vacation. It's like working with candy through the whole process. And uh, you can smell the rum as we're making it, this aura. Of, we create an atmosphere of rum that when you pull into the parking lot, you just kind of follow your nose. <laughs> so these are uh, some of the products that we have now that we are retailing and wholesaling here in the area. We are also developing and uh, have now a, uh, a, a joint venture with uh, Mother's Brewery. A few years ago, we took some of Jeff's uh, Sandy Wheat Beer and brought it down to the distillery and distilled it into a really interesting hoppy whiskey. And we've now aged that for two years in our Missouri White Oak. And uh, soon, Mother's Brewery will be releasing their sandy wheat for the season. And we'll also be releasing our sandy wheat whiskey at the same time. So we're really excited to be able to co-market uh, companies. Uh, I really enjoy what Mother's is doing. They enjoy what we're doing. So it's this wonderful opportunity to co-market. Uh, four years ago, uh, a little more than four years ago now, my partner, Eris, and I uh, met as I was teaching uh, rum classes. And so we made a batch of rum four years ago and uh, was able to release and sell that within a, about a month and a half. So there is no more rum. Uh, the four-year rum, we went through it very quickly. However, we do have the next batch, was, which is a year old, and we invite you to try that as well. Our products, the, the whiskeys and the rums that we're talking about, we have found uh, it makes a lot of sense to complement and pair these products with the consumer. For instance, we have these small whiskey barrels that uh, hold about four or five bottles of our moonshine. And that allows our customers to purchase our young whiskey, take the barrel home, and age it into whiskey at home involving them in the process of the whiskey making. So we make the young whiskey, they take it home and age it, and then they can share it with their friends and family, being a part of the whiskey production. And we've had great success with that, along with our infusion kits. Uh, we've been making moonshine for quite a while now, and it's been really interesting to see the wave sort of catch up with us. And if you look on the shelves, you find cherries floating around in moonshine, and, and everybody's sort of bottling. There's a lot of artificial flavoring and coloring going on. Well, we stick with our tradition and encourage people to buy our jars that have the infusion ready to go, allowing you to buy a bottle of moonshine and the jar, take it home and age it, and create your own liqueurs on the kitchen counter. And so again, it involves our customers in the process, and they, they have this uh, sense of ownership in the products that they're uh, producing with us. All of these are available online as well, uh, which leads us to our sales channels. Uh, the on-site retail, our tasting room and gift shop, allows us to share our whiskey production with our customers. So we do tours, uh, we educate people, we show them how it's made. You can actually see the yeast bubbling and the still running and, and be a part of this process. 
So this allows us to uh, engage the customer, educating them on our spirits, and we find that they buy a lot of, uh, of our spirits uh, in, in that environment. Uh, we can also retail online. It's through our website. We have 40 states, which Missouri allows us to ship to. So UPS is now our modern bootlegging uh, service. And you can literally order a bottle of moonshine from our website and sign for it at your home through UPS, which we really enjoy. Uh, the off-site retail has been really successful for us as well. The uh, farmer's market on uh, Republic Road, we've, we've been down there for a year. And it's one of the funnest things that we get to do to sample our, our products at the farmer's market and, and retail there. Uh, and the vendors love us too because everyone's walking around with a Bloody Mary and they tend to buy more. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a great way for us to retail our products and uh, uh, market our, our company at the same time. Uh, and then, of course, the wholesale. You, you might have seen us in some of the area restaurants and uh, bars and, and some liquor stores here in Springfield. And we're slowly building our, our wholesale business as well. How we promote ourselves. I'd mentioned the tours earlier, which is a, a wonderful way to educate our customers. Uh, when people try our products, they, they usually go back for that second sip and then go for the bottle. Uh, so sampling is very effective for us. We also feature local singer-songwriter uh, musicians on Saturdays at Copper Run. We make our products from scratch. We like our musicians to share their made-from-scratch products as well. So the music uh, with our, our singer-songwriters who produce their own music at Copper Run has been a, a lot of fun for us. Uh, we're also just a few miles north of Branson, which brings in six million tourists to our backyard each year. So we like to uh, do a little advertising in Branson, making sure that the tourists know how to find us. Uh, of course, online, uh, press releases, uh, uh, website, uh, Facebook, and Google ads have been very effective for us. And the news leader, uh, the, the newsletters. Uh, when customers come see us from all over the world, we ask them to share their information so we can stay in touch with them. And what we find with Branson being such a tourist-oriented business, when, when people go back home, they'll tell their friends and family about us. And then when they come to Branson, they find us. And so I like asking people how they found out about us. And when someone walks in the door and says, our neighbors were talking about you, and then they say they live in Florida, I, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> Jim? Your time's up. I'd love to let you go on because it's just a spectacular product, and, and it's probably something we're all interested in, but I need to open up the floor for questions. Sure. I um, have one more point here. Just We have some new products coming up, and we have a barrel program, which is an investment program allowing folks, uh, investors, to actually purchase moonshine at moonshine prices that then goes into the barrel, and two or three years later, we now have a product that's much more valuable through the aging process. So I'll, and, and now I would be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Jim, so you said your family was in the distillery. Could you tell us a little bit about that? My, my grandfathers were winemakers on both sides of the family. So as a young man, I knew that yeast did amazing things. Uh, and my father, back in the 70s, when the gas crisis was going around, uh, I think he read an article in Mother Earth News on how to make your own ethanol fuel. And so he did. He made a, a, a batch of corn whiskey on the uh, kitchen stovetop. And I was 10 years old, and of course that had a big impression on me. Uh, my, my parents uh, raised our family uh, living off the land, so we knew that we could make anything that we wanted. So we wanted peanut butter, we made it, we didn't go to the store. And that applied to wine and, and whiskey and other things that I've always been interested in. <laughs> talk, talk about your startup costs and how you're trying to manage your debt right now, because you're relatively young, right? Like yes, we've been, this is our sixth season now, and that's a very good question, and it's been very important to us at Copper Run in that our startup costs were very low. Uh, they needed to be because we were so small and, and went into business without a budget. Uh, I was very fortunate to have equity in my home back in those days and borrowed against it just in the nick of time and was able to invest that equity into the business. And I had very little on top of that to start with. So the flexibility and the ingenuity and the small batches is how we got started. And each day that grows. 
and uh, continues to grow. So we've kept our overhead at a, a very minimal amount, allowing us to operate and continue to grow, reinvesting constantly into the company. Hey Jim? Shoestring budget. <laughs> Speaking of shoestring budget, can you talk about your scalability and where you're looking at production-wise and growth-wise with your facility and staffing and that kind of thing over the next five years? Sure. Uh, we are at a stage now where we uh, have been bringing in equipment, reinvesting uh, capital, and have the ability to produce far more than we ever have in the past, uh, five to six times of what we've been able to do, and we're right at that point now. And the idea is to produce more than what we're selling so that we can put it in a barrel. Each barrel is like a savings account. As that whiskey sits there and ages, it becomes more valuable. And all I have to do is sing to it every now and then, and get it some fresh air. Uh, so it's really important for us to increase our production, aging it in those barrels, and increasing the value of that spirit as it sits there quietly aging. Uh, staff, we continue to grow with. Uh, we all work very hard. I'm very proud of our staff. We, uh, we work very hard together, uh, again, making sure that we get everything that we put in back out. Uh, and, and our labor costs is very important, keeping that in check. Um, scalability. We, we have uh, uh, our plans this year are to build a barrel house. And the barrel house is, gives us the ability to, to fill it full of barrels. And so the barrel program that I mentioned earlier gives us an opportunity to work with investors who can actually invest into this whiskey future, if you will. And filling and building the barrel house, our business plan is uh, the foundation comes from investors who are buying whiskey futures in that sense. So uh, you mentioned that uh, obviously tasting it is a big part of getting everyone hooked on it. Um, being in between Branson and Springfield and those tourists coming into Branson, having to drive out and find it, or you know, people in Springfield having to drive down to find you, is there a way or is it in the budget or in the business plan to have a storefront in Branson or Springfield to eliminate having to drive, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes to, to sample what you guys have? That's a really good question. We are off the beaten path. We're 10 miles north of Branson and, uh, you know, 12 miles south of Ozark and maybe a little further from Springfield, obviously. Uh, and this does two things for us, it, it, um, especially with the tourists in Branson. The people who come see us are the adventuresome type. And so we have incredible customers that seek us out and find us. So that's a benefit of being off the beaten path. We're not at the landing. We're in the Ozarks. So you can sit on the back porch, you can sit on the front porch, and you can watch the squirrels and the birds and be a part of the, the Ozark Mountain experience. And that setting is very, very important, illustrating our fundamental business philosophies, that grassroots, focus on quality and the environment that we're in. Uh, so we use that to our advantage. Uh, from that location, we can produce products in wholesale. Uh, so uh, uh, here in Springfield, for instance, we find it very beneficial to have our whiskeys in different restaurants and, and bars in the area, giving our customers an opportunity to try our spirits here in town and then learn a little bit about us and then perhaps seek us out to come actually see where it is made. Um, so with our limited uh, space and um, uh, the size of our uh, property down there, uh, we can produce a tremendous amount of spirits. And uh, through wholesale and online sales, uh, we, with that location, we can produce plenty enough. Hi, I have a question. <coughs> What was your background before you started this business, and um, did you get any assistance from a mentor or organization to help you with your idea? That's a great question. Uh, uh, Bill Owens would be my mentor, and Bill Owens, way back in the 70s, began the microbrewery movement in California. And when I was 19 years old, I read an article that you could make homemade beer, and uh, legally. <laughs> And so I did, and from that point, the, the beer making hobby became an occupation. And I was able to move to California and work in the microbrewery industry at that time, getting to know Bill Owens, my mentor. And back in those days, there was a rumor that Bill had a still. 
and any brewers in the area that would be interested in experimenting with that still, that he would be open to that. So now Bill is the head of the American Distillers Institute based in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco. And each year we have conferences and educational um, uh, programs uh, educating the public and sharing information with other distilleries and, and distillers. A uh, 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 hundred different distillers has a hundred different techniques. And so working in the beer brewing industry was very beneficial and very helpful for me to then move on into the whiskey distilling business. You have to make good beer before you can make good whiskey. So it's been a great pleasure for me to turn another hobby into a business and to continue working with mentors like Bill Owens. So I'm curious, it, it's kind of like uh, bourbons from Kentucky, champagnes from France, Chianti's from Chianti. It, does Moonshine carry the Ozarks uh, name with it as it goes other places? And if so, is there that unique market where you can charge twice the amount when you get outside of the Ozarks? <laughs> Moonshine comes from all over, uh, the, certainly from the Ozarks, but the, the, the guys and gals in South Carolina and Kentucky and Tennessee are going to tell you that moonshine comes from there as well. So moonshine really is untaxed, homemade liquor. <laughs> and, and now it is being marketed in all kinds of ways across the country. Uh, so I think of moonshine as uh, made from scratch, uh, uh, locally produced and high quality whiskey that just hasn't been in a barrel yet. Now you can buy all kinds of other moonshine labels that have nothing to do with what I just described and you'll find them all over the country with the moonshine fad that is sort of sweeping the nation. Uh, so we stick to our, our basic focus and stick with the quality and will continue to be around when all the other fads fade away. That's an excellent question. Uh, barrels last a long time. You, you can find a 50-year-old Scotch whiskey that's been in the barrel that long. Uh, now, um, American whiskey is brand new oak. So straight whiskeys and bourbon whiskeys are in a brand new barrel, meaning that Jack Daniels or uh, Jim Beam has to sell that used barrel to the Canadians or the Scottish or the Irish or the Jamaicans making rum. So the rest of the world uses our used barrels. And so if you think of that bourbon that sat in a barrel for six years and then went to Scotland to age whiskey for 30 years, you can see that the barrel has a very long lifetime. Now, the first use of a barrel extracts a lot of oak, and that's why bourbon is so dark and oaky. They say that bourbon, the flavor, is 80% oak, 80% barrel, 20% being the grain that it was made from. I like using used barrels along with our new barrels, which give us more of a balance between the oak and, and the grain, much more like the Irish and the Scottish whiskeys in the used barrels. You can still taste the grain, so you get more of a balance between the oak and, and the grain itself. The little barrels that I uh, had mentioned, you can put many, many, many gallons through a one-gallon barrel using the old-timers technique. Uh, they would, let's say they had a five gallon barrel for, for their friends and family, they would fill it up with that fresh moonshine and age it to the point where they really liked the flavor. And so then they would take a couple bottles out of that family barrel, what to share with family and friends, but whatever they took out, they would top that barrel back full with new moonshine. And this creates a blend which goes on year after year after year. And the oak, uh, continues to have an influence and effect on that whiskey. So it, it's uh, the old, how do, the saying was, uh, the old whiskey in the barrel teaches the new whiskey how to taste. <laughs> Gary. We, we are putting all this together now, and we don't have all the details worked out exactly. We're sort of fine-tuning it right now. So anybody who is interested in this, please reach out to us, and, and we will get you this information. Uh, Gary, I'd like to use an example of, of how this can work. We've been doing it for a long time on the small scale with the small barrels. We can sell barrels of all sizes up to the 53-gallon barrels. 
Uh, so we had been doing this for a while, and so I was really surprised to be at Sam's Club a, a couple years ago, and I saw a big barrel of Jack Daniels for sale. I was like, well, they're copying us. But it, it does exist, it is possible, and uh, we're very interested in taking this in a new direction. For instance, if you were interested in, in a barrel of whiskey as, a, as an individual to share with your friends and family, you can tell us what type of whiskey you like. It could be a wheat whiskey and you can actually come and help us make it. So you can be a part of making your whiskey. And then we'll age it for you, and you'll know that you'll have 250 or 300 bottles, however uh, the, the batch goes, uh, sitting waiting for you. And then you can even come and help us bottle it when it's ready if you like. We can work with co-marketing on labels even. We also have business owners who own bars and restaurants and want their house whiskey produced by Copper Run. So this gives us an opportunity to work with this individual in California who has a chain of bars and restaurants wanting their house whiskey. So we can custom make whiskey and custom label whiskey for these individuals as well. The, the payback is the whiskey, it can be. Uh, we can also cash out because that whiskey is a lot more valuable right now. And I'd rather sell it, <laughs> right? So it gives us an opportunity to bring in 50% of that value and use that working capital the other 50% then uh, would be due upon receiving the whiskey, or we can buy it back and sell it at a much higher cost as, as our own brand. So Jim, there's a lot of flexibility, and we have something that fits for everyone. Well, Jim, we thank you and for being very transparent and open with us. Uh, as always, we wrap up with the question, how can we as a community help you? Tell your friends and family about us. Come see us. Let us show you what we do. We'll, we'll put you under our spell, and, and you'll love us for it. <laughs> Thank you. We, I, I think there's still some coffee left, and I know there's lots of whiskey and rum back here. So please, come, come sample our products with us. Thank you, Jim. Uh, there's definitely samples in the back, cone chips, and uh, lots of whiskey. Uh, a couple corrections. The Refine M uh, product launch is actually 4 to 6, April 23rd, here at the E Factory. And beyond that, we encourage you guys to connect with us online, Facebook, Twitter, check out our uh, YouTube. And we will be uh, streaming live from now on. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>